Regards, and welcome to a bonus episode of Ryan Rambles You to Rest, the podcast where I talk at length about matters of nearly no urgent need, nor heavy impact on our daily lives, in the interest of helping you there off to a more peaceful state, unconscious or otherwise. As of this recording, It is the holiday season. In many parts of North America, trees are turning colors and the days are getting shorter. In part because of the end of daylight savings time, which I hope it does not distress you to know, I actually like quite a bit. Besides weather and changes to our clocks, the holiday season of course brings with it the holidays themselves. The holidays bring together friends and family who must traverse rain and snow, suffer long car rides, TSA lines, flight delays, and long lines at shops and supermarkets, all to, ideally, enjoy time together. Because it is a secular holiday in the modern age, however religious and colonial in origin, and because the central focus of the holiday itself is enjoying a large family meal together, I have chosen in this episode to attempt a roundup of holiday dishes I know with a focus on the Thanksgiving holiday. Before we begin, I would like to recommend that you subscribe to this show on your podcast platform of choice, or YouTube. For news and announcements, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ryan Rambles Pod, or follow me at Anvil1 on Twitter. Our soundtrack is by Disparition. <laughs> If you are like me, dear listener, then one of the most exciting things for you about the holiday season, apart from seeing friends and family, is the joy of a well and truly gluttonous family meal. The sort of giant meal that leaves you tired, spent, and content. Of the three, apropos of our time now together, tired being the most important. There is nothing quite like the slow, hazy, and warm drowsiness that washes over you after a hearty holiday feast. So herein I thought it would be fine for us to round up some of the best of the bountiful banquet items to bolster our buffets during the time fraught with festivity. Although I imagine that I am most likely to focus on the Thanksgiving holiday, it is entirely probable that a handful of delectable desirables may belong to other holidays or unspecific seasonal meals. Unlike our incursions into vegetable enumeration, I feel far less likely to stumble into inappropriately miscategorized territory. However, in the spirit of care, I would like to get right out of the way that I will not include imaginary or hopeful holiday additions, such as the Christmas dog which we discussed during another recent visit of Ryan Rambles You to Rest. A quick reminder about the roundup. Here I list strictly from memory without notes or preparation, and may therefore ramble in just about any direction to the detriment of successfully listing everything in our topic du jour. 
To begin, I believe that it is essentially impossible not to address the enormous bird in the room. Indeed, it would be irresponsible to even flirt with the possibility of not talking about Turkey. We have to talk Turkey. It's important to talk Turkey. In part because the matter of Turkey is actually quite contentious, it seems. Now, I grew up personally preferring the white meat, and more often than not, I had a regular cooked in the oven for several hours turkey, so I didn't truly or really experience the alternatives, which is to say the alternatives to cooking style or preparation style of the Thanksgiving turkey. I would, my experience was quite, quite sort of standard American. And of course there was, on any given Thanksgiving turkey, dark meat. And when I was a kid, I didn't much care for that. But I should say that I have definitely turned almost completely around in the other direction as I've gotten older. I think that before you get into any kind of alternative cooking methods or tricks of the trade in preparing the turkey, there is most definitely and always going to be the element of the dark meat. And almost no matter what happens in the preparation of that turkey, the dark meat is going to end up being the juiciest, most moist, of the meat coming off the bird. I think part of it is when I was younger, it was kind of like, I didn't really appreciate fat. Younger, often younger American kids also prefer less fatty, less salty, more bland food based on just sort of upbringing. So my jam was really just the white meat and gravy, and I don't recall, but I don't think we had especially fatty gravy. And then, as I said today, it's different. Now I want the dark meat. Now I want, I, I see the fat the rendered fat in the pan when the turkey comes out of the oven, and I just think, oh, well, something has to be done with that. That's good fat. I think if I had my way, that definitely goes into the gravy, where I'm more used to whatever the mix is that you get, just add water, or whatever they recommend. I'm not sure. I don't have a, in front of me, a you know, recipe or a packet of instant gravy. I mean, you know, juicy and fatty is where it's at. I think that in particular has been a part of, um, in the last probably 15 years, really broadening my horizons more on food in general, but especially just internationally speaking. Most other places I've been in the world have a far more obvious cultural reverence for animal fat. 
and in fact even non-animal fat, just fat in general. Whereas, you know, when I was a kid, uh, you wanted to trim the fat off of the meat, like a steak or whatever. So that's where I've come around. And I will say, though, that I don't really fault anybody for having a difference of opinion. I do think it is more of an acquired taste, and truthfully, the white meat is the least offensive, or potentially offensive. Like, you can kind of do what you want with the white meat. Smother it in gravy, get a little dollop of cranberry sauce on there, a classic combination. Season it with just a little bit of salt and pepper if you don't want any of that other stuff going on. I mean, you're, you've got your options there. There's nothing totally wrong with it. But I will definitely say that my preference has gone leaning very heavily towards that more moist and juicy dark meat. And then I suppose as a side note that I should add that I'm I'm definitely not super into any of the other bonus parts that come with the turkey. I'm not a I'm not an innards awful type of person and you know maybe that's something I need to work on but you know over over a few decades I managed to get from the white meat to the dark meat so maybe we can check back in in two more decades and see if I've added anything else Now, you can't talk turkey without talking stuffing or dressing. I think that stuffing was always my favorite as a kid. What's not to like? Salty, savory bread with fat and onions and other things added. Normally meant to be cooked inside of the turkey to absorb some of the rendering. But of course, you know, classic Middle America stovetop stuffing doesn't require that. It's probably anathema to some people, but I think that is kind of my thing. I like the stovetop. I had it so much that somebody actually making like a better version of it is usually not my jam. It's probably a good time just to admit it now that when it comes to Thanksgiving food in particular, I'm not exactly what you would call super highbrow. We grew up with a lot of the staples that go on the Thanksgiving table, but I don't think we ever did it really super fancy. Um, You know, I'll just tuck it in here. I'm not a very big fan of the cranberries or the cranberry sauce, but I'll have some on the plate, especially the first plate at Thanksgiving. It's part of the trip. But my version of that, my the way I always see it served in my mind on the table is just plopped out of that can and then sliced. That gelatinous cranberry-flavored log sliced into manageable portions And that, I mean, I do have a soft spot for that. But I don't really recall having another kind of preparation for cranberries. Now, I have some memories of having a few different stuffings, 
or dressings, but not many, and I do remember that I wasn't that into them when they weren't simply the stovetop version. It's a little embarrassing, but, you know, these are the tastes of home and youth and comfort food for me. Now, in my adult life, I've had a few cases of having stuffing elsewhere and a few cases at a restaurant. I like it kind of in any form, but I will say that when I think about it, I think about the the stuff that comes in the box. I want to say that stuffing is my favorite, but if it's not my favorite, I would say it's the staple. It's like, it has to be on the plate. When I go back for seconds or thirds, there's always going to be stuffing. Even if I can't stand to do anything else, there's going to be stuffing. So that sort of makes it my favorite, but I have, you know, a few other things that aren't stuffing that are still, like, maybe more important to me, and we'll get to those. But stuffing, I think that's a, you know, for the purposes of this roundup, that's a good number, too. Are you kind of a stovetop person, or do you prefer something a little bit more fancy? Let me know. Next up for me, I just need to get out of the way a family dish. And I think family dish might be, you know, a little on the loose side, but it's a dish that to this day my family eats. We give credit to my Aunt Karen for the recipe, although it's always been sort of assumed or believed that it probably came out of a magazine or the back of a box or something like that many, many years ago. But this is Aunt Karen's broccoli casserole. And it is definitely what you would expect to come off the back of a box or out of a magazine. It's, you know, super easy to make. It's some chopped onions, some frozen broccoli florets, uh, I think a lot of butter, and uh, Campbell's cream of mushroom soup and then crumpled up and I think butter added again Ritz crackers for the surface that crisps up when you bake it that's just another one that I've had so many times almost probably once a year for my entire life that's a lot of times probably even sometimes more than once because it would be a different family gatherings, and then of course you have to add into that leftovers, so leftovers means you have it that many more times, so I would say that I've got to be in a neighborhood of having just sat down to eat it a hundred times, and I would say it's probably the most important to me. I kind of feel like the holiday didn't get all the way there if I don't have the broccoli casserole. And specifically Thanksgiving. I can get through Christmas without it or other holidays. It really is traditionally just for Thanksgiving, but we've popped it out a few other times. I'm sure there's another hundred recipes that use Campbell's cream of mushroom soup, but this is the one that we ended up with. Mm. 
I feel obligated now to go to mashed potatoes. Who doesn't like mashed potatoes? Are they the best? Most of the time, not the best. However, essential. And they have the potential to be the best. Mashed potatoes can always get to that point. They can rival other dishes. Now, I grew up with the kind of puree experience, if I remember correctly. I don't believe that we had just the -the out-of-the-box, like, powdered potatoes, but I remember mostly creamy potatoes as a kid. You know, a soft or mostly soft pile of potatoes that you could, you know, ladle gravy, a pool of gravy into. And then kind of do whatever you want to add further flavor, salt, pepper, butter. Now, of course, a real solid mashed potato recipe is already about half butter. You could say it's mashed butter with potatoes. And that really is the way to go. If I remember correctly, there was one year, though, where my Uncle John made potato, mashed potatoes, and he made them kind of chunky and I believe may have even been with the skin still on. Regular russet potatoes. But honestly, that just blew me away. Chunky potatoes with the potato skins, plenty of butter, lots and lots of black pepper. I was, I was a changed lad. I'm not sure that I've had mashed potatoes that topped that since. Maybe I have had better, but that moment, that was the one. Mashed potatoes in general, I mean, you don't see them very much nowadays in, like, regular dinner fare. But they are, they're pretty classic. I mean, you still find a potato puree at some places. A steakhouse is going to have mashed potatoes. I don't usually eat at steakhouses. It is a classic dish, but for me it does seem like a lot of the things that come around at Thanksgiving just don't make their way out to other meals very often. Maybe that's what makes them special as a holiday food or experience. But in any case, the mashed potatoes are essential. And if they're outstanding, then they're also getting back on the plate for the second round. I don't think there's very much more to say about mashed potatoes. They're all right. Yams. Yams and sweet potatoes. Not really my jam, yams. But they're um, one of those things where I do respect that they are appreciated by other people. I feel like I almost get it. Like with the mashed potatoes where I had the sort of eye-opening experience with the right seasoning, the right level of mash, the right amount of butter. 
I feel like I maybe just haven't had the eye-opening yam experience. But I can see how it's close. I can see how they're almost there. It's definitely the first thing that we've rounded up so far that doesn't necessarily make it onto my plate. If there isn't room, then this one is a casualty for sure. But if there is room, I'll give them a go. I feel a certain amount of responsibility to give them their due, give them a shot every time there's a chance to give them a shot. I sometimes like sweet potato fries. They're a case where I wouldn't normally order them, but if they're done really well, I'll admit that. Perfectly fried, not too greasy, maybe a little bit of fresh herb. Maybe like a garlic fries version, with a little bit of garlic, maybe a little bit of cheese. Grated. Sweet potato fries are all right. Not my first choice. And really kind of down at the bottom of my list of the fried foods you're likely to find at a burger joint or a soul food place. But that doesn't mean that they're not good. They just come in behind basically everything else that's pretty fantastic. I'll have to give the yams and the sweet potatoes a little bit more time. With fries, I don't mind it so much if there's like a half-and-half half situation. So maybe, maybe that's the trick. Maybe mixing it up with mashed potatoes is the solution. Maybe I can give it a shot and let you know. Speaking of half and half, and not the dairy product, but there was a burger truck that I used to go to that had an option as a side with the burger to have a half-and-half half basket of french fries and string beans. And the string beans were on point. They were spiced somehow and well-cooked. Probably a little greasy, but that went well with the burger. And half and half fries and beans was pretty solid. Which is what makes me think that I definitely have to bring up string beans as a holiday dish. String beans haven't always been a staple part of my Thanksgiving experience. But I do like them quite a bit. Sometimes somebody makes a string bean casserole similar to the broccoli casserole that I talked about earlier. So some form of Campbell soup probably, a cream of celery, a cream of mushroom, crispy onion, Not an essential staple to me, but if it's there, it's going on the plate. If it has to get heaped on top of something else, it's still going on the plate. 
String beans in general I kind of like. When I was a kid, I think I liked them a bit. When I was a kid, I kind of thought there were just two kinds. There was like the the French cut or whatever, and then like the sort of regular cut that came in the can. And somewhere along the way, I really liked the French cut ones, and I don't remember why. I think they maybe they have like a little bit of a acid in them, but I'm not positive. I got into them for a bit, and for a while thought it was good to have them around, but now I don't really keep a lot of canned food on hand for regular consumption. I like to have a bit of a stock of canned food for emergency purposes, but since we don't really get canned food on the regular just to eat it, um, I haven't had those beans in a long time. And when I think about holiday food, I don't think about that canned stuff. That's more of like a regular meal. But string beans in just about any form can be pretty good. I really like string beans. There are, where I live, there's a few, and even just throughout my experiences, there have been many um, Chinese restaurants that can do a really solid string bean in different sauces, sautéed, garlic and string beans, string beans in some form of protein. It's definitely like not a every time go-to for me, but I like to have string beans as like my primary veg when I get like a Chinese food delivery situation. This seems like it would be a good time for a digression. Almost every year on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, friends of mine and I get together at various times and in various capacities throughout the day. If you're around for the whole day, it's a whole day thing. And what it begins with is getting Shanghai soup dumplings. There's a place in our area that is quite fantastic for the soup dumplings. We also get some wings and some dry fried shrimp that are out of this world. But this is a little bit of a segue because sometimes we get string beans. Now, I would say though, to be fair, that these soup dumplings and the fried chicken and the shrimp are so good. We do eat them from time to time at other times of the year, but this is sort of the day that we definitely plan on it. And for that reason, I would say that I think that the soup dumplings, for me, count as holiday food. And I think there's a few out there who share this opinion with me. They are essential. Now, you might have family obligations because of the immediate prior Christmas holiday, and for that reason may struggle to find yourself in a position to celebrate Boxing Day. 
But if you are able to celebrate Boxing Day, whether it's with friends or family, I will say that soup dumplings are a great way to kick off your day. The place we get them from, we usually get like a full order of soup dumplings per person, which is, I don't know how many, it's 10 or 20. It's probably 10, but it sometimes seems like 20. And they're, you know, these perfect little dumplings with a little bit of a filling and broth inside. And they are served with uh, vinegar. I'm not sure what variety of vinegar. And you pour a little bit of that on top of the dumpling or into the dumpling if you are so savvy as to nibble the top off. And then you get some of that acidy goodness in there with the rich filling and the beautiful broth. I think this is truly a fair point for me to mention this in the roundup because I think that after those sort of staple items from Thanksgiving, when I think of the holidays, this is probably what I think of next. My group of friends has been doing this for probably about 10 or 15 years, so it's, it's definitely a tradition at this point. Now, of course, they're best right then and there. If you can go to a place that has the dumplings, the Zhao Long Bao, here in the Bay Area, that's relatively easy to do, but you might have to do some searching if you live somewhere else. Now, that said, I've not personally thought of making them myself. Not, not in the traditional way. I have, like, a recipe I've thought of that does something similar. But... I would say that if you're a somewhat dumpling-savvy person, it might be worth it to treat yourself to making some dumplings in advance of Boxing Day and just having those on standby, ready to go, so to speak. Even if you can't do the soup dumplings, I'll bet any kind of dumpling would really be pretty good around... 11 a.m. the day after Christmas. Dumplings just sort of have that quality of being comforting, warming. A cure for a hangover, if you happen to have one. Pierogies come to mind. We live in a heavily Asian-populated part of town, but also a part of town that has a deep Eastern European and Russian background. So we have a lot of Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, that sort of thing. So we have quite good pierogies as well. We usually like to have a good package of pierogies in the freezer. A lot of these places sell them in bulk, so we like to have them on hand. But boil those up, a little bit of pan fry, some onions, and then, you know, if you keep a solid, good, flavorful olive oil on hand, just a little bit of that on top, salt and pepper, and then maybe some sort of protein. We will do, you know, because we're a mostly vegetarian household, we'll do some kind of 
vegetarian crumble. But you could do it probably with a little bit of ground beef if you had some. That ground texture is good for it. Truly, dumplings in general are just a wonderful thing. I mean, you kind of can't go wrong with dumplings. Well, I mean, I suppose you can. You can overboil the type that you're supposed to boil, and you can overfry the ones you're supposed to fry, but I think you know what I mean. I hope you, like me, are a pro-dumpling person. What are your favorite kinds of dumplings? Let me know. I would like to take a short breather here to diverge momentarily from holiday food that I definitely very much like to take a moment to address before I forget about it that ham is often and traditionally a mainstay of Christmas food for some families, or I think also Easter ham. It seems like you can have turkey or ham at Christmas, and then you have ham for Easter and turkey for Thanksgiving, and so that Christmas is just this confusing combination of the two when it comes to food imperative and so I want to address that it exists, but that I am not very big on it. I should be, because I think if I had to choose only one animal to be in my diet, I would go with pork, probably. Bacon is kind of the best thing in its way. Not very filling necessarily, but great bacon is great bacon, and I think that's somewhat indisputable. And I didn't really find out about it until I got older, but Pork belly is also kind of amazing when done right. Pork belly I've had in actually different countries, and it's sort of fantastic just about everywhere. I had, I think maybe one of the best soups I've ever had, and that I've in fact tasked myself but haven't followed through on is making this rolled noodle soup that I had in Thailand in Bangkok at um, at a place that was sort of known for it that happened to be across the street from the hotel we were staying at in Chinatown. And I'm not positive the origins of the dish. I've looked it up a few times, and there's really only... I have found a couple of websites that describe it. And then the other thing is that there are two versions of it, sort of like how there's a northern and southern pho for Vietnam. There are two different kinds of this noodle soup, and the kind that I had, that I loved, was very light. It had like a rather light or not too murky broth, and 
it was very peppery. Like, I think they might have used a lot of white pepper, maybe? And there were some meatballs in there that were also great. And then the problem is that there is another version that is really, really kind of hearty and heavy. And I don't know enough to know why they have the same name. But the more common version, at least that I've seen on menus here where I live, has been that different version than what I had. And I think I found maybe one recipe online as well that was also the other version. And that other version, like I said, it's more hearty. It has a lot more ingredients. And definitely the more ingredients that would make the average, you know, American a little squeamish. Sort of like Bun Bo Hue, if you can come across that, you know, it's the sort of famous soup from Hue in Vietnam, and it has, like, everything in it, and therefore can be a little daunting to, to get through. This is definitely a bit of a digression, because the pork belly relevant part of this is that I had it as a side dish with that noodle soup. And it was, you know, crispy and also fatty and every, I mean, it was everything that pork belly should be. And I had it as the side the first time I had it, because I had it twice. And it was definitely best to do it that way in my opinion, but the version of the soup that they sort of champion there is the version where the pork belly is in the soup. For me, the preferred augmentation was just get the meatballs in the soup and then get the pork belly on the side, and the pork belly was great. I like it when it is crispy. I like the crispy and the fatty and the tender all-in-one-bite kind of experience. Because sometimes, you know, you'll just have dishes that have pork belly in them, and then, you know, it's more of the tender and fatty, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just not quite the same. So ham as like the ham steak, I'm not wild about. I, I will admit that I am okay with like a good honey ham, but I'm, you know, I mostly just okay. And the ham steak I'm just not wild about. And I'm not really that big on ham in the lunch meat area either. It's obviously a main staple out there. It's hugely popular. But when it comes to sandwich meats, I'm more of the sort of leaning in the Italian direction of some of the salty meats and then also the direction of mortadella. I think mortadella is my favorite lunch meat. A friend of mine a friend of mine referred to it as grown up bologna and I think that's fairly accurate. There is a place close to where I used to live that was a Polish deli and they made everything in house. And if you're lucky enough to have a you know, butcher or deli that makes their own meat uh sandwich meat. 
you're a lucky person. I think that's not a very common thing anymore in the United States. And they had a bologna that was quite good. I just tend to think that for sandwiches, there's just so many other things I would rather have on it than ham. I'm a big fan of the Italian hoagie by way of growing up on the East Coast. And I've seen them or had them a couple of times where ham was the sort of primary lunch meat in there. And you can kind of get away with it, but I don't... I don't think that you should. Maybe it's the cheapest ingredient option, but I think I would even rather have bologna in there if I don't have mortadella. And then from there, you can kind of choose your own adventure between having a a copa, some form of salami, I think you do want to have three meats no matter what you do. A place I used to go to a lot here in the city that discontinued their hoagie is probably the best Italian hoagie I had outside of, you know, Philadelphia, New Jersey area. And they put uh, prosciutto on it and... I'd say if there was anything that I could do without, it would be that. Prosciutto is great, but you know it can be kind of tough to eat. And it doesn't, it just doesn't play as well with some of the other ingredients as a different meat would. And so ham, I just don't feel like it belongs. I do like a good ham and cheese croissant. I used to live by a donut shop that made them. And if you were lucky enough to walk into that donut shop when they were fresh and still hot, you had a real treat coming to you. But yeah, I can take or leave ham most of the time, particularly in that steak form. And I'm also not big on pork chops, so it's it's interesting to me that there's so many elements to and types of pork preparation that there can be whole categories to like and not like. I had uh, pig's feet for the first time in Paris. That was a bit of an experience, definitely something to, you know, a taste to acquire. It was definitely a little overwhelming for me. I got through it, but I didn't know, you know, what it would taste like or what it would be like. And it was definitely like something I hadn't had before. And it was at a French restaurant, that like a late night place that was known for that dish. And I think it's a, an obligatory item on the menu, but probably most people don't actually order it. I don't know that I would do it again, or if I went to that place again, I would probably get a different pork option, because they're still known for their pork. But for me to try to go down the pig's feet direction again, I think I would need like another, almost just like a different cuisine. Like I would, I would have to have it in another country or another type of restaurant to, to, to go again. Because it is unusual, but I I mean, I feel like sort of where this is all going is just that there are so many 
types and preparation of pork that it's easy to simply, you know, like for yourself, for whatever your personal tastes are, to have a pork hierarchy that's like your, you know, ranked list of types of pork and I feel like because there is such a galaxy of options there that you're just likely to have several that top the list that are so much better to you than the ones down list that there's almost no reason to look in the direction of what's down list. You know, we're not usually in a situation the average modern diner, uh, at least in the United States, I don't think is very often in a situation where they have to be considerate of all of the different ways of using pork because we're not buying entire pigs and having to make the best of it. We have a lot of different restaurants to go to. We have a lot of different cuisines to try. And so we're just not culturally confronted with the necessity of using the whole animal or being considerate of making sure that we use the whole animal. Another one I like is a, a ground pork, which you don't see much in American food other than maybe like so like breakfast sausage where you get really like a, pa a patty. And I guess there's other like forms of like pork sausage, but and this shouldn't be a sausage conversation. But I have had a few larb salads and Thai places that have a really good ground pork or ground chicken. Part of it is some of the great sauces that they make for those things. But we don't need to go really into every single possible preparation or consideration of pork, even if I've gone through quite a few by this point. I feel comfortable enough that we've sort of highlighted, if not in depth in part, all of the or some of the many different pork preparations that, at the very least for me, is more pleasurable than the kind of traditional ham steak. Do you like the ham steak? Or is there another preparation of pork that I haven't mentioned that you really like? Let me know. We definitely cannot talk about holiday food without talking about pie. The top level, the top floor of holiday pie tends to be considered to be the pumpkin pie. It's relatively ubiquitous. You can get the pumpkin pie just about anywhere that somebody bakes at the holiday season. The pumpkin pie is also pretty good in almost any incarnation. It's like how people say, like, even bad pizza is pretty good, which I don't believe. I do feel somewhat that way about pumpkin pie. I, I can say for certain that I've had poorly cooked pumpkin pie before. Maybe dried out. Maybe overcooked crust. Maybe undercooked filling. Maybe filling that isn't the right balance. I've had all of those things, but I can say that I think in almost every case... It's been edible. And that combination of flavors that the pumpkin pie is known for are... They're winners. 
and that combination of flavors that the pumpkin pie is known for is a winner. In the fall, we get pumpkin spice everything, which I've never really bought into, but I understand it. The pumpkin pie is quite good, and if you're going to replicate that in other places, well, just go ahead. It might not be my thing, but I get it. I can't really say bad things about it. Pumpkin pie, I feel like, is sort of like the cousin to key lime pie. And I love key lime pie. But key lime pie is, I almost want to say for me, it's the pie that is on the table for the entire rest of the year that the pumpkin pie isn't. It's almost like a pie superhero situation of you can't really see key lime pie and pumpkin pie in the same room at the same time. They just are sort of opposites. To me, maybe equally enjoyable at times. And you can have a bad key lime pie. I've had bad key lime pies. But I've had a handful of amazing ones. A year ago, we went to the Florida Keys and had key lime pie down there. And they've got other things that are key lime flavored because they have to. But we had some exceptional key lime pie. Definitely, if you're going to the Keys, you have to get key lime pie. Even if you ultimately discover that you know, they don't really necessarily get their key limes locally. Key lime is a lime that is available in other countries. It's a sort of a biome-dependent type of lime. It grows best in tropical places. And you really don't need to trouble yourself with all of the key lime-themed things out there. Just the pie. I'm not a like big expert overall on the holiday pies, but I want to, I think, give a little just a shout to the mincemeat pie, which is something you don't see very often, I feel like, unless you are in a situation where somebody in the family or extended family believes that it is part of the tradition of the holiday food. I don't think that there are many people that seek it out, that, you know, recognize it as completely essential. If you have a small enough party, then you would definitely leave the mincemeat off the menu in favor of other pies. But I believe it should be mentioned, and I think considered, It's a different kind of thing that's not as desserty, even though it is a dessert, but it is also very much an autumn food or a winter food, and it is quite good for that. It can be very dense. Lots of fruits and things, maybe nuts. 
It's been so long since I've had a mincemeat pie, but I do remember that when I was a little kid, I didn't care for it, but then I got a little bit older and thought, oh, this is pretty good. It just doesn't come up very often. So I'm not sure what other pies are necessarily important or a part of the holiday consideration. I feel like I've been in enough holiday situations where a variety of pies are available, but they're not necessarily traditional. Of course, you have pumpkin pie, but maybe a good chocolate cream pie. Maybe that's what comes next. Super good chocolate pie is hard to beat. However, if I'm looking to beat it, I will say that if it's not certainly the best pie I ever had, it has to be in the top three. And that is the banana cream pie that you can get in Hawaii. There is a place on Maui, on the west side, that's south of Lahaina. It's a little restaurant slash pie shop. And they make a absolutely heavenly banana cream pie that is so good. The other pies they have are good. I have tried several of them. But the banana cream pie is the go-to, and it is just so good. We've been there a couple times, and I think each time I've had to have that pie at least twice. It's quite essential. And it's the only place I think I've really gotten into that pie, so I don't have the same sort of experience with the banana cream the way I do with pumpkin and key lime. So I can't vouch for the banana cream pie in other places. I'm talking about here a very specific banana cream pie. And their pies are so good, I'm sure if you went there and wanted a key lime, a pumpkin, or maybe they do minced meat, I don't know. You would be in excellent hands anyway. And their pies, they make basically like personal-sized pies. You can get a regular-sized pie. But here they make sort of single-serve pies. So one of the options on your table is to get a banana cream pie and then get something else that might be your favorite. You owe it to yourself to get the banana cream pie. But if there is another one that's your favorite... You get that too. They have boxes designed to hold two pies. So you're good. It seems fair if we're going to talk about pie that we should probably also address cookies. Cookies at the holiday are fairly essential. Folks making Christmas cookies, sharing them. I like when there's a sort of neighborhood, family, or friends cookie share. Each household makes its own cookies, and then everybody gets a little bit of everything, and then you have this, you know, couple of tins or one big bin of cookies. You 
Even though I'm not a giant sweets person, I do have to say that the bounty of cookies when it happens is quite righteous. It's sort of the more kind of heartfelt version of having a lot of leftover Halloween candy. If Halloween candy is a topic that you find intriguing and are wondering why Halloween candy is not being included in the holiday food episode, it would be because on a prior bonus episode of Ryan Rambles You to Rest, we discussed the popular Halloween candy. So I think my favorite cookie for the holidays is a peanut butter cookie with a Hershey's Kiss in the center. The Hershey's Kiss doesn't really usually show up or have a place in the Halloween experience but Hershey's Kisses are definitely sort of almost a staple chocolate candy at Christmas time. They're the sort of thing where you might get a few of those in a stocking. But the real money is on that chocolate and peanut butter combination that you get from the cookie. There's really probably a galaxy of great holiday cookies. Even just a straight sugar cookie with some sprinkles on it can be pretty great. You know, shaped like a snowman, a Christmas tree, that sort of thing. There's another kind of like technically cookie that I remember liking when I was younger and I don't think I've encountered it in a while but it was almost like a mini pie that had I think something like a dried fruit or nuts in it I almost want to say it's like a miniature mincemeat pie but I don't think that's what it was necessarily but almost like the kind of shape of a small peanut butter cup but you know with a filling basically a tiny pie I remember liking those a lot and because it's cookies of course you can't go wrong with any of the cookies that aren't you know necessarily Christmas cookies I mean a solid chocolate chip cookie everyone likes If you're getting involved with one of these cookie sort of potluck situations and you're not sure what to make, nobody's going to fault you for a solid chocolate chip cookie. Although I guess in its way it's a trap. Because the chocolate chip cookie is so revered that there's a lot more pressure to perform Now, to be fair, you can almost not go wrong, even a chocolate chip cookie that's been a bit overdone and is dry is still a chocolate chip cookie. But there's a lot of pressure there. I do like a good macadamia nut cookie. Um... I'm not sure if I'm in a minority on that. I like that white chocolate and macadamia nut cookie that they have from whoever it is, Pepperidge Farm or something. I think that's a good combination. You don't see macadamia nuts very often, but they pair well with chocolate. 
There is a really good macadamia nut ice cream in Hawaii. I forget what island it comes from. But if you go to Maui and get Hawaiian shave ice, you'll sometimes get that shave ice with a, a serving of the Hawaiian macadamia nut ice cream at the bottom. And as far as, you know, grab-and-go delights are concerned, the Hawaiian shave ice with macadamia nuts has to be way up the list, especially if it's hot out. Fruity, refreshing, but also creamy. That combination I wouldn't have thought of before I had it. And I think it's pretty great. If you're in Maui, you want to go to the famous Ululani Shave Ice. There are other places as well, and it's not a mistake to go somewhere else. But you also should make sure to hit the famous. I used to really like Chips Ahoy cookies. We're getting a bit far afield of holiday cookies by bringing it up, but we're talking about cookies. And I don't know when we'll talk about cookies again. So I would say that I'm a fan of the chocolate chip cookie from Chips Ahoy. I haven't purchased them in years, but I used to get them all the time. I used to get a big package of Chips Ahoy and then make sure to store it in a Tupperware container because they stayed fresh. And fresh Chips Ahoy is what you want. You want it to be fresh. And I always just loved dunking those in milk. Chips Ahoy as a milk cookie snack is pretty solid. They're dry and crispy, really dry. Let's be honest, they're exceptionally dry. But dry and crispy normally, and then, you know, you gotta dunk it in milk for two tenths of a second and it becomes soggy and dissolves. Definitely nobody's idea of what a real cookie is, but that's American snack food for you. Or really snack food from anywhere. So it seems proper to bring up Chips Ahoy, and, and only fairly so if I mention Pepperidge Farms. And if I can promise myself that we're not dwelling here, it's also fair to give a little bit of a shout to Oreos. For some folks, Oreos are the top of the food chain of cookies, and it is understandable. I also used to be really into... Oreos. Not as much as Chips Ahoy, but I always kind of liked Oreos. But I think, and I assume maybe even just historically so, that when we talk about cookies and cream ice cream, we're talking about an ice cream that has basically Oreo in it. The Oreo cake. I believe I've mentioned our local ice cream shop before, and at this moment I have in our freezer a mint Oreo ice cream that is fantastic. There is also, or I should say there was also at some point in history, the sort of revolution to bring the pleasure of eating cookie dough into other formats. 
So you have cookie dough ice cream. You also have now cups of edible cookie dough that you can find in your freezer section. I understand the draw. And you can still, if you so choose, go and buy a log of cookie dough and just have slices of it as a sweet snack. I feel like if we're getting into logs of cookie dough, then maybe we're at a point where we've talked enough about cookies. What are your favorite kinds of cookie? Let me know. Talking about logs of cookie dough has me thinking that it's probably good to mention that logged food is a bit of a holiday concept, a little bit of a holiday tradition to log food. Having something that is rolled up and sliceable is kind of a good thing if you are serving enough people. So, logged desserts, logged appetizers, logged entrees. For vegetarian or vegan folks, there is out there a holiday log which tends to consist of a vegetarian stuffing inside a log of vegetarian turkey-style meat. It's not so bad. If you're looking to have a meat-free experience, it's okay. But I would say that if you're looking to have a meat free experience and you want a logged food or tubed food, that there are recipes that are far better if you have the time. My partner found a recipe a few years back for a pretty delicious portobello wellington and I'm sure you could find it if you looked it up. But it was, you know, a marinated series of portobello mushrooms wrapped in dough and baked, and then you'd have a reduction to pour over it. So it wasn't dry, and if the portobello is good, it's tender. There are logged desserts, there's a particular kind that I don't remember what it's called. It might be something log that we've had where you make a single sheet of cake. And if I remember correctly, you're going to go like a pumpkin cinnamon something maybe. And you make this sheet and then on the sheet, you then add a layer of cream that might be spiced or flavored in some way, and then you roll the whole thing up. Put it in the freezer, and then when it comes time to have that dessert, you can just pull it out and it slices right off. You just take a slice, and then you have this little spirally thing with uh, cake, cream, maybe there's a layer of, you know, a fruity layer that goes in there. And that's pretty good. There are logged cheeses for appetizers. And there's nothing wrong with having a cheese, spreadable cheese, especially in just about any form. 
I need to therefore recognize the cheese ball, which is a fun thing to make if you want to make something that's a good little snack to serve to people if they're visiting at the holidays, is to make a cheese ball. A few years ago, we, we found a recipe for a cheese ball that was sort of a cone shape, and you made the, made the cone shape and then sprinkled it with fresh herbs like parsley and then had a little cut out piece of lemon peel to be a little star on top. And then you have these Christmas tree cheese rolls, cheese balls. I don't know what we call it if it's not in ball form or log form. Spreadable cheese shapes. I've always been a big fan of the spreadable holiday cheese. You really can't go wrong there. Some spreadable cheese and crackers. Maybe a little dried fruit and nuts on the side. Goes pretty well with your glass of wine, your malt cider. Your... Sparkling cider, your pre-dinner cup of tea, perhaps. And I think, therefore, it is also fair to talk about cheese as being a, an appetizer or a presence. There aren't a lot of dishes that I can think of in a holiday sense that really star cheese but a nice holiday cheese plate is fantastic. Any cheese plate is fantastic. Cheese plates in general are great. It's nice to have a good variety of cheese options. Spreadable, hard. Some varieties of cracker. or toast-type things. And then you really can't go wrong having some good honey on hand to go with those things. Honey, cheese, crackers. Good stuff. Outside of the winter holiday season, but a holiday nonetheless is, of course, St. Patrick's Day. And as such, it would be definitely a mistake to talk about holiday food and not bring up corned beef and cabbage. Corned beef and cabbage is quite good if you get used to it. I grew up having corned beef and cabbage from time to time at St. Patrick's Day. And then when I was older, a friend of mine sort of made it his thing to host St. Patrick's Day and make the corned beef and cabbage. And He really got into it, and so did everybody else. We got to the point where we were acquiring many, 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 many pounds of corned beef. He would go into a butcher shop or go to Whole Foods and clean them out on corned beef. So if you live in San Francisco and you can remember a St. Patrick's Day where you went in maybe on the day and they told you there was nothing, no corned beef for you, that might have been our fault. Lots of preparation, potatoes, cabbage, breaking everything down. 
and then a spectacular rub for the corned beef, sweet mustard, and an overnight cook. An overnight cook that has to be occasionally monitored. So you're basically cooking for what maybe I'm kind of romanticizing in my mind, but basically an entire day. And the results are worth it. The most tender corned beef that just disintegrates and has so much flavor. Tasty cabbage, filling potatoes, cooked in a broth of great spices, served with some sour cream, really quite something. Now, traditionally, even when we got large quantities of corned beef, we would most often eat all of it in the evening. However, if that didn't work out, if we didn't get all the way through it for some reason, that meant we were set up for breakfast to have some amazing corned beef hash. In fact, when we were savvy about it, I think we would set some aside to make sure that there would be corned beef hash for a brunch get-together the next day. If you are interested in the subject matter of corned beef hash, then I recommend that you check out a prior episode of Ryan Rambles You to Rest, in which I discuss hash as a food or item that evolved over time. And in the United States, the corned beef hash is actually almost traditionally the the sort out of a can. Now, that's not what we would have in the aftermath of corned beef and cabbage on St. Patrick's Day. And I'm not familiar enough with Irish or Irish-American custom to know to what extent corned beef and cabbage are a dish that you find outside of the holiday. If you are finding yourself with a purveyor of Irish foods, there might be a few others that you would consider ahead of corned beef and cabbage if you had the option. It seems like throughout the British Isles, for example, a form of shepherd's pie is a great way to go. We used to have a Irish bakery in the neighborhood a place where just about everything was good. And they did, in fact, around St. Patrick's Day, have a corned beef and cabbage sandwich. But the real winner there, besides a giant breakfast sandwich, known as the Belfast Bap, was their shepherd's pie. And they had sort of the traditional, which was the most readily available. But their other less frequent varieties were also sensational. They had a mushroom shepherd's pie that was vegetarian. And then probably the real winner was the chicken curry shepherd's pie. The reason I say I don't know enough about Irish and Irish-American tradition is in part because these particular foods are so good that, and they're so 
comforting. They're very comfort food-like, you know, a stew and potatoes type of experience. That it almost seems like they ought to be holiday food if they're not. In any case, the corned beef and cabbage is a clutch holiday food. And if you have the opportunity, you really should seek out a great one come St. Patrick's Day. I think we'll round out this round up of holiday food simply with the category of soup. Not a specific soup, but soup itself. In the colder seasons, soup is always good to have on hand. And not every family has a traditional soup for the holidays. But soup does find its way in sometimes. My partner and I hosted Christmas for the first time a few years ago. And I recall making two soups. The first I wanted to be sort of light at the beginning of the meal and made a variation on a sorrel soup I found a recipe for. And that turned out okay. It was pretty much just a green puree. And the other soup, the main soup, was Alton Brown's recipe for a holiday soup. In fact, it might have even been a Christmas soup. And that one was a little bit more hearty. I forget what sort of tubed meat it called for, but I was able to try for the first time using the Beyond sausages. And those worked out very well. In fact, if you're looking for a meat alternative to having something on a toasted bun, those are quite good as well. But soup is always good for the winter time. Soup is a good comfort food. Soup is usually a good one-pot solution to feeding a large number of people. So if you've got a holiday soup, you know that that's going to be a worthy and workable central part to your repertoire of food on the table. It's usually good for leftovers as well. Soup is always pretty solid. Being the most popular liquid food that there is. My favorite soup is probably the corn chowder recipe that found its way into my family somehow. It's not a holiday soup per se, but it is definitely a winter soup. It's got corn, celery, onions, cream, potatoes. For the meat side of things, it's got a sausage, usually a ground sausage, which we talked about earlier. Traditionally, I think we used like the Jimmy Dean sausage. And then what is or at least used to be somewhat difficult to find on command, uh, knockwurst, and also notably dill. The dill flavor is very much a part of it. You may have had a potato leek soup that was similar. This was one of those childhood favorites of mine you could make a large batch of it and freeze some and have a tasty, hot, hearty soup whenever you wanted. As such, I've learned to make it as a grown-up without meat for my partner and I, 
and I have to say it's a it's great to have a few containers of it in the freezer for just the right moment. Soup is such a broad and wide category that I really can't go into detail with every type of soup that's so good. And it wouldn't make sense for this holiday-themed show to go too deeply into it either. But I still believe it's important to recognize it. And maybe think about the winter soups in general that go in here. I've always thought of minestrone as one of those types of soup. Maybe the Manhattan clam chowder. Maybe these just sort of hearty soups with lots and lots of ingredients. I always, I feel like those are always good for the winter time, even if they're not at the holiday itself. It seems to me that it is a somewhat worthy matter of holiday food to mention soup. Does your family have a holiday soup? Let me know. Well, goodness, are you even still conscious? We've rambled about such an abundance of bountiful food that I feel heavy and tired just talking about it all. Of course, I have not been able to list everything, and I would be very curious to know of some of your own favorite food traditions that you and your friends and family love to enjoy. Connect with me on Twitter at Ryan Rambles Pod or at Anvil One. Well, I think we'll leave it here for this bonus episode of Ryan Rambles You to Rest. I hope you have been adequately rambled to rest and are not hearing what I am saying right now. However, if for some reason you are conscious at this time, I will leave you with these parting words. Nondescript. Fall. Careful. Boundary. Imagine. Acid. Instrument. Grab. Observation. And ink. Thank you again. I am your host, Ryan. Music has been by disparition. And we'll see you in the next episode.